Hello and welcome to Talk Time. This week, we are taking a look at the state of the national economy. Is the economy doing well or not doing well? What about all the reports that have been produced by FIT, by Bloomberg and so on? What, what do they really mean? This controversy about taxes, what taxes we should, we should charge and what taxes we should not charge, how to expand the tax net, all the things about the economy that we've not been able to understand for some time, we're going to try to understand them today. Welcome to Talk Time. Welcome back to Talk Time, and as I said, we're going to be looking at the state of the national economy. And we are indeed very, very privileged to have in the studio somebody who knows about the economy, somebody who has learned about the economy, somebody who actually teaches economics at the University of Ghana. He is in the economics department of the University of Ghana. Uh, we are happy to welcome to the studio Professor Festus Ebo Texan. So you're welcome to this. Thank you, Chrissy, and um, um, good morning to your viewers. Now, Prof, generally, what is the state of the Ghanaian economy, generally? Um, the Ghanaian economy, as we speak, um, uh, is having some fiscal challenges. And um, uh, like you rightly said at the introduction, um, We've had some negative reports by the credit rating agencies on our economy. And so when you look at our fiscals, especially with regards to the public debt and issues about sustainability, our debt service, it doesn't look really good like we'd have expected it to be. But the other aspects of the economy that we haven't done too badly, even with the devastating impact of the COVID. And so um, my initial take on how the economy is doing will be a mixed sort of uh, commentary on that. On one hand, in terms of our fiscals, um, public debts, there are, are issues that we need to take a look at, especially in regards to sustainability, given that our debt to GDP ratio would increase above 80% uh, by the end of, of this year. And the fact that a greater chunk of our domestic revenue is being committed to servicing our debts um, um, cause for concern there's no doubt about it but uh, on the other side looking at the rural sector our gdp growth um, we were one of few countries who in 2020 didn't retard in terms of a negative growth rate we had something very low but it was still positive um, last year we had a growth uh, we are projecting for 2021 a growth of about five percent which is is, is is not too bad so, on the real sector, we are not doing too badly. Um, inflation, uh, if you remember when we went to the IMF for the um, ECF, we uh, perceived some policies that have seen a sub sharp decline in our inflation rates. Um, in fact, as at the end of 2019, inflation was 7.9. We were able to hit the targets between the band of 8 plus minus 2. So, um, we've not done too badly. Just that after the COVID, we've seen inflation increase above the single digits. Uh, we are still somewhat 12.6%, uh, which is above what we have been targeting for our medium term growth strategy. Um, our currency has been relatively, I would say, stable like we would have wanted it to be, but um, we have hovered around between five. And, and six um, over about two year period and um, uh, of course you know the impact of the depreciation of our currency even on our nominal debt alone because if your debt is in foreign currency 
you don't need to borrow more for the nominal debt to increase because when you need more cities to convert to a dollar, it means that in nominal terms, in terms of your GDP, your debt will increase. So relative stability, we've not really enjoyed it uh, as we might have expected it to be. But what is most important to note also is the fact that lending rates have also declined. Um, so it looks like on the monetary aspects, we are, doing, we are not doing too badly in combination with the relaxment. Apollo has been with the fiscal policy. That is the huge problem that we need to do something about. There are serious structural bottlenecks that we need to see how best we can overcome them. And I think it has been a problem for all governments, irrespective of who is in power. And, um, um, I, I, being born in an in Kumai's family, I, I, I always say that we're too comfortable with the sort of free stuff that we were given. And Ghanaians have, have known to enjoy free stuff. And with the political dispensation that we have, we've seen that governments try as much as possible to give out a lot of freebies because that is what having Ghana will look at to go and vote. And that is why we are having to saddle ourselves continuously with fiscal deficits, especially in an election year, that would always throw away all the fiscal consolidation that I would have done before the election year, and we threw everything off board. And it's, it's not ended, and I don't see that ending very soon. So that would be my initial comment on the economy. Yeah, Prof, so when you talk about the physical aspects of the economy, what exactly are you talking about? So government runs the economy. Government collects taxes. It also relies on some grants, if it can have access to them. And at the end of the year, the total receipts of government will have to be matched to the expense of government. Government is a public sector. It has employees. It pays wages and salaries. Um, it does capital expenditure in terms of building roads, uh, fiscal infrastructure, all intended to see the economy expand, create more jobs. So that's, that's always the focus of government. So if government doesn't produce anything but the expense and is the main agent of development, then it needs to raise enough revenue. And especially given that now we are talking about Ghana beyond aid, we need to be very self-sufficient in raising enough revenue to expand. But over the years, we have not cut our code according to our size. We, we project to raise revenue and we even go on to project an expenditure that is way above the revenue. So we have had fiscal deficits all along. In every country, your total debt is a cumulative effect of the fiscal deficit that you've run over time. So when you add them up, so I spend 20% of GDP, I raise 15% of GDP. That's your shortfall of 5% of GDP. I need to borrow from domestic sources or external. Then it adds to my debt. Next year, I do the same. So the, an ending chain of, of fiscal deficits has led us to where we are. So that is, is the problem that we have in terms of the structure itself. So there are two sides to it. So why don't you raise enough revenue to, be able to pursue all the initiatives that we want to raise um, to support our growth and development agenda? One thing that has hindered the efforts of government has been the large informal sector. The inability for Ghana to make good use of what we call the income taxes. Because if you go to a developed world, that is where they collect all their taxes. And so trade taxes and those things are just a very similar portion of their, their revenue. Everything is dependent on income taxes. But you need the persons to tax to be in a net for you to be able to, to zone them in and collect the income taxes. Now, when you have a very large informal sector that remains out of the net, then it means that you and I, who work in the formal sector, are the ones that pay the taxes. And how much can we pay in taxes? So our domestic revenue mobilization efforts have been very low. And so what was needed for us to do as a country was to see how best we can um, widen the tax nets and bring in those in the informal sector. Some of who would be willing to pay tax, but there's no avenue for them to do that. And that would have called for much more invested 
investment in the Ghana revenue agencies because it's these things have to do with infrastructure I mean um, so that has been a problem with our resource mobilization but when we are, we are a low-income country we are fortunate to be beneficiaries of some aid and grants that were available to low-income countries that are having challenges and then with our production we moved into a low middle income so then the resources that were available for low-income countries were not going to. So at that time, we should have instantly started reforms to domestic resource mobilization. Because the challenges that we're facing now were challenges that have been with us for some time. And we should have known that the more we delayed on the domestic resource mobilization, the difficult it was going to get for us. Because we tend to have an electorate that was strong appetite for development projects. They want to see things. They want to see good roads. They want to have access to good drinking water, schools, and all of that. And yet we are having, at times, and if you look at the domestic revenue, for instance, I mean, from a percentage of almost 22% in 2015, it dropped to about 15% in 2019 as a percentage of GDP. So in terms of the size of our economy, we're not even collecting more. At the same time, even though there was some decline in our expenditure as well, the fall in, in, in the revenue was, domestic revenue was much more um, higher than the expenditure. So, so that, that, that has been the reason. So when we talk about the fiscal challenges that we face, this has been the reason why we have not been able to do that. Am I correct in assuming that when you talk about the physical side of the economy, you are basically talking about the management of revenue and expenditure? Precisely. Precisely. Basically, that. basically that's what it does. That's okay. what we talk about. So the management of our revenues and our expenditure, precisely. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has done some studies. Yes. And they've come up uh, and said that uh, we are spending 128% of total national revenue on two line items, debt servicing and the public sector emoluments. Yeah. Is that not a very, very bleak outlook? Yes, it is. I mean, it is, unfortunately. And um, I have said over, over time that we need to take a content analysis of why we've gotten to this point because if we don't do that, we'll keep on doing the same things we've been doing in the past and it will not end anywhere. I mean, the, the sort of um, rating that we got from Fitch had to do more with Fitch not thinking that our commitment to fiscal consolidation in 2022 will be met, especially given what was happening in Parliament and the potential that the E-Levy was going to be the game changer in increasing our domestic revenues to 20% of GDP. And so if it was debated in Parliament and it looks like it was going to be difficult to be passed, then it meant that if you have 7.4% fiscal deficit that we are projecting will be moving into the double digit. And that meant that, hey, if you want to give money to government, you want to buy government debt, be careful because um, the consolidation that we expected doesn't look like it's coming on. So I would say that the debt service has been very, very um, um, responsible for the situation that we have. Because when you do a content analysis of our debt profile, I've seen over the last three, four years an increase in amortization. Uh, that means that the amount of uh, our loans that are due for payment, the principal amount. So apart from the interest payments, we are having to also repay some of the debts. Normally, if it is to commercial investors that you get from the ICM, the international capital market, you cannot renegotiate. There are individuals like us who have invested and we need our money back. But if it's normally with multilateral, bilateral agencies, um, you could negotiate. Say, look, let me restructure this debt so that instead of paying you the principal now, I'm having some challenges. Is it possible for us to extend the repayment period and then negotiate on the interest rate that I'll pay? That alone 
would help us to free ourselves. But once we are heavily uh, um, um, involved in the ICM, some of these debt restructuring will not become available. They, they won't, I mean, when you give them that signal alone, they even want their money now mm -hmm. because you're having challenges now. What shows that in the future, you're not going to have challenges. So it, it's, it, it's, it always means that we have to look at the, the amount of amortization that we are paying, the due ones that are going to come in the immediate term, mm -hmm. The next year, two years, mm -hmm. and if we are borrowing now, what is the borrowing going to? I mean, in development economics, I tell my students that it is not just the level of the debt to GDP ratio that matters, but the plans in place to reduce it. Very important. Look, if we are going to borrow now to build real infrastructure from Tematakradi right up to the north. It's going to expand the Ghanaian economy. We are fortunate to be along the coastline and we have not taken advantage of the position that we are to service. Look, West Africa has the largest number of landlord countries all over the world. Mm -hmm. So those along the coast have to take advantage of it for trade. Because trade is a very important tool of development. The East Asian targets use trade. But we've not been able to take advantage of it. So if we are going to borrow to build rail lines from Takradi and from Tema all the way to Burkina Faso and beyond. Then I'll say, yes, let's go for it. I don't care if the debt ratio will be at 90%. What I'm excited about is that it's going to increase the volume of trade that goes along our coast. And it's going to offer employment because people are going to be having to deal with more trade volumes. Those that would be working along the rail lines are Ghanaians. And what it means then is that we are able to generate higher employment, be able to collect more income taxes, and then we increase our domestic resource mobilization, whilst at the same time we are expanding the economy. I won't have any problems with that. I only get concerned when we are borrowing to amortize the debt. Um, and the reason why I'm not comfortable with that is that if you are borrowing from the ICM now to amortize your debt, and they are aware that is what the intention is, they are going to charge you a much higher interest rate. So instead of borrowing to expand the economy, part of it is going out back to where you borrow the money from. So the rest that is left for you to expand the economy is a little bit smaller. So your economic expansion is not at a level that will hurt your debt to be sustainable. And it is one of the risks that comes with countries when they borrow on the ICM. So when we became a middle-income country and we were going there, we should have known that at a point in time, these things are going to come up. And we should have put in place, especially with regards to domestic resource mobilization, the right infrastructure that was going to help us soar our domestic revenue. Look, because if you are going to be comfortable, as Ghana is going to control, our domestic debt to GDP ratio should be at a minimum of 25% of GDP. Then we would be able to sustainably service our debts and also to grow our economy. But even with the 20% that we are talking about now, these credit agencies think that it's a little bit too ambitious. The IMF has also said that. So even at 20%, there are issues with it. But the, the exciting thing is that we are now making, taking advantage of the digital revolution to see how best we can get people into the tax nets and then get them to pay taxes. So yes, currently the debt service plus the emoluments of public sector workers are eating up all our domestic revenue, which means we don't collect domestic revenue to invest in our economy in terms of capital expenditure, and that is not a good sign. The suggestion also that uh, we need to expand the tax net, looking at the informal sector, yeah. has been challenged by the IFS study. Okay. Because the IFS argues that uh, most people in the informal sector are not earning taxable income. And therefore that option would not bring in a lot. What's your reaction to that? But it will still bring in more revenue than nothing. I mean, so let, let's take that for... for, for let, let me accept that. Mm -hmm. That we have an informal sector that is 
is, is huge. And majority of them are working and any incomes that will not be taxed. But there are also others who are in a huge amount of incomes that go untaxed. And so rather than say not, won't do that, we can still pursue the collection of those taxes. Now, when we started this tax stamp for those who offer personal services, and the Ghana Revenue Agency will tell you that it's brought in some revenue. I mean, at that time, there was the same argument, well, how much that these people earn? Because there are people who earn a lot of money in the month, much more than I earn as an investing lecturer, but I pay tax. But they don't. And there are some who would really want to pay tax. But the point has always been, where do we go and pay the tax? How do we assess the taxes that we need to pay? We've not had enough education about taxes in this country. And so um, if you even ask me how much tax is taken from my income at my level, I'm not able to tell you how much percentage is taken. I know I'm paying tax. And when my money drops into my account, I know it's net of the tax. I don't know. So if I'm in the private sector, I'm an informal, and I earn income. How do I even walk to the Ghana Revenue Agencies and say, this is my tax? I need them to assess that. And how many of the revenue agencies are scattered all over? And when I'm talking about informal sector, I'm not talking about somebody who is doing business as a Congo and then the IRS is teaching out of the Congo. Somebody who has to travel, who in this world will incur a cost to get to a revenue agency and say, this is me, this is what I earn. Come and take your tax. No, we have to go to them. So it's important. That's why I'm saying that we need to resource the Ghana revenue agencies, not only in terms of personnel, but give them the supportive infrastructure so that if we are going to take advantage of the digital technology, especially that which comes with our mobile telephony, people should be able to sit in the comfort of their offices if they want to pay tax assess themselves and pay by mobile money, for instance. And there should be some incentives for paying taxes. I mean, and I, at times I think that the failure of governments to in the informal sector is also the fact that, you know, when you earn below the, the, the taxable income, government is supposed to support you. Mm -hmm. So at times I have a sense that, no, this is going to make us more, more, more expense than not. Because, of course, obviously, if you tax me at a particular level. If my income drops below the taxable income, you are supposed to give me a tax rebate and all of that. So at times, I think that that is why we are apprehensive. But there are a lot of people in the informal sector who don't pay tax, especially those who offer um, 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 artisanal services, uh, masons. They, some of them are contractors. They are building Ghana's real estate. It's not only those that are building the formal sector and renting out or selling. But there are a lot of people who are putting their homes all over. Look at the rate at which Accra and other cities are springing up all over the place. And there are a lot of artis artisans who are putting that up and they don't pay tax. He comes to build your house, he says, I'll charge you 8000 for my service after foundation. You pay the 8000 to him, he doesn't pay any tax. But 8000 is a lot of money. I mean, so we need to see how best we can provide incentives. And this is where what we can do in the interim. For instance, Anybody who wants to have access to government services should be able to show taxes that have been filed. Not only just to have the, the tax identification number, but also to show that in 2021, this is how much taxes I paid. And then you get a government service. Because government offers services and expense on those services that it's offering. And he has to use the revenue to do that. So if you don't contribute to the revenue, how do you have access to the service? I mean, our national health insurance card and everything, people should show their tax ID and their tax clearance to to have access to them. When you begin to do that, I'm very certain that those huge taxpayers who are in the informal sector who are not paying taxes will go and pay taxes. I mean, I know there are other issues like if, if you want a government contract, fine, show us that you pay tax. But those are just those who are in the formal sector. The informal sector, a lot of people do not pay truck bars, restaurants, and even now that we have this um, revolution on the on the internet, where people now, I mean, when I'm in the office, I want lunch, I just go on Glovo, I look for something appetizing, I buy it, and then I eat, and I'm sure these things go untaxed. So there's a large untaxed economy on 
the what do you call it the online and it's something that we need to take a look at. i think that's what informed the electronic transactions levy that the government was coming up with um, that has become a, a huge uh, debate so we can that the informal sector as much as i i will not doubt the findings of the ifs for instance but i think that there is there is a taxable portion of the informal sector that can bring in more revenue there's an issue which is not strictly speaking economics, yeah. but it's it's important. Yeah. It's been suggested that people's reluctance to pay taxes comes directly from the opulence of public officials. Precisely. It's it's one of the main reasons. I, I happen to have been in um, a friend's office. I mean, he has, he's a private businessman about four years ago. And... Um, so we were there when the uh, Ghana Revenue Agency's um, staff came in there. They normally come to him to come and check his. And it normally happens when he's playing a lot of adverts on TV and radio. <laughs> 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 and so when they walked in, it was like, well, you see, because of the small adverts I've been playing on radio, this before I hear. And so we were engaging in a conversation. And then it came up. I mean, at that time, there were issues about corruption and uh, politicians doing this and that. And so I asked them, so is that a normal thing you do to go to? And they said, oh, yes. So I said, okay, that, that's fine. I mean, when you're raising revenue and you go to the clients and you go assess them, otherwise. And the one of them was like, these days when you go out, people even want to beat us up because the taxes we are going to collect from them there is thinking of pull us all over by politicians. And they ask legitimate question. They are come to take this money from me, a poor man like me. Mm -hmm. I have workers. I'm struggling to pay them. And that money goes into a, a kitty where those who have access to it by law are required to manage the press. Mm -hmm. I'm fronting all over opulence and all of that. So what, what, what legitimate reason do you have to come to me? So yes, people raise those issues. They are legitimate issues. I mean, in some countries, these things have led to civil strife because people see their money is taken away and they are not even partaking in the, the benefits of that. Because when taxes are raised, they are supposed to go back to the people in various forms of government services. That is why Ghana has to do something about corruption. And um, normally when I begin to talk I, like this, I move into the political, uh, what do you call it, uh, sector of the economy. Uh, that. I mean, I've heard over in time the Public Accounts Committee revelations in Parliament. But I don't know if I'm not follow up. I've never heard anybody being prosecuted. <laughs> uh, it raises a lot of issues. You are wondering at times laptops are bought for 80,000 Ghana since one laptop and all of that. And it raises issues. And you don't hear anybody being prosecuted. So there is, there is no strict adherence to the law to prosecute people to serve as a deterrent. So people are flouting these regulations. And at times, it's not only just the politicians, in the public service. Mm -hmm. When you go, some of the regulations that come up are in public institutions where procurement officers are procuring uh, computers and things at levels that you, you cannot even think about. Mm -hmm. So these are all the sort of things that Ghana has to, and, and we need to put in place measures to start prosecuting people selling their properties and all Ghanaians seeing that these properties are being sold, the money is returned to the kitty and all of that. At that time I was reading something about one case of corruption against some officials who said, oh, the money is there, we'll come and pay back the money. And they were negotiating with the judge to be on them because they were going to pay the money. I mean, that's not, that's not, so if they're not calling they're gone with it. They should return the money and they should be punished. We need to do something to serve as a deterrent so our people are not corrupt. But corruption is not only at the highest level of political office. I mean, I see that around me every time. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a very sad story. Uh, I used to drive past um, a bar where I normally buy this local uh, confirm. I normally sit in my car when I get there, oh, can you give me two packs? And then one day when I got there, I uh, ordered a young man, about 15 years, brought it to me. When I put him on, the thing looked too light. I said, oh, why are you sure it's two? He said, yeah, it's two. 
So out of curiosity, I opened one. When I opened one, I didn't see two of the ties. Mm -hmm. There were no ties in it. That was it. I said, well, why are the ties? So it's in the other one. Because I did them together. I opened the other one. There was only one tie. So for the two guys that had to, I, I needed four ties, there was only one. I said, where are the ties? So I got out of my car. When I looked on his table, he, has, he had kept part of the meat there. Because he thought I always sit in the car, he brings it to me. I said, but that is there. What are you doing with that? Mm. Oh, boss, I'm sorry. Mm. So when I walked past, I was like, you see, our corruption, this, this generation has lost it. So this is clearly a young man, about 15, 16 years, who might be working for the dad or uncle, doing this. He does this over time. He gets out of school. He gets himself into a public service or political office. And the thing that is the norm. He has to find shortcuts of making wealth. And it's something that we need to, we need to do. And, and I think that the civil education is not really doing well in letting us live to our civil responsibilities by educating us, making us always hear this, that they do the right thing, make sure that you are not being corrupted and all of that. But we don't hear that. And it's also part of the big problem of how we are fighting our political parties. And so people invest in parties mm -hmm. and when there are parties coming to power, they need to recoup what they've invested, all of these things. So, um, yes, it's, it's a problem when people see opulence all over and they are still being pursued for taxes. Some of them even end up in jail. Uh, Ghana Revenue Agency is trying to show that they are working, send these small, small petty businessmen to jail for maybe a week or two for not paying their taxes. While the big ones who are supposed to pay the big taxes are left on the hook. So that's, that's the problem that we have, yes. Well, viewers, we're going to go for a short break, and uh, when we come back, I'd like to ask Professor Festus Ebo Texan about some of the other economic indicators, like the gross domestic product, like the rate of inflation, and so on. What do they really mean for us? Short break. Hello? Okay, uh, what's the name? Why? My wife is sending me a Hello? What's happened? It's a friend. I'm going to use you. My wife is sending me a here. In my office, I'm going to send you a message. She's going to send you a message. I'm going to send you a guy. I'm going to send you a guy. I'm going to send you a family drilling company limited for one car. What's it then? Family Drilling Company Limited. Here to borehole, biofuel, biogas, swimming pool, plumbing works in Yinaso, Yeyebi, Freye, 0240-333-111, and NASA 0244-144-822. Me and Pa and Anna, we want swimming pool and we see. Me want to, we want to be here. Family Drilling, I want Family Drilling. The first is your last set. Yeah, welcome back to Talk Time. Uh, we are in conversation with Professor Festus Ebo Texan. And Professor Festus Ebo Texan is from the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. Now, Prof, there's this problem with inflation and whether or not it really reflects changing prices. Yeah, you see, the, so the whole architecture of collecting inflation data starts with first um, getting what you call the representative market basket. That is what a typical household consumes uh, in a month. So for instance, there will be some bread, there will be some cake, obviously, uh, utilities, possible fuel, entertainment. And so, in the process of coming up with a typical market basket is flawed, then no matter what information you collect, it will not truly reflect. And normally we collect these from a, a household surveys, like the Ghana Living Standard Survey, or there is one that we normally collect for inflation as well. So when we get a typical market basket, the next thing has to do with the... So we know the typical market basket and the expenditure shares, typical households are involved in. 
But if it's truly reflective of the Ghanaian household, that's fine. The next thing is to consider the, the data itself that goes into calculating the, the CPI. And that process is done by getting the prices of the components of the food, the, the, the market basket from the various markets all over the country. If those who are involved in sending that information are not doing it accurately, the inflation data will not reflect what happens out there. So it's important that if the whole process of the inflation data collection will truly reflect um, the actual happenings on the market, then the whole process should be um, done with some integrity. I mean, I'm not saying that's what we are doing is not correct, but I'm, I'm saying that this is these are the, the sort of things that go into the collection of the data so if there are any problems with any of these processes then it's, go, it's not going to reflect so it's important and and these days in digital technologies it's possible that we could build an infrastructure that will label us be able to tell what the wholesale prices are the retail prices are or the markets of these goods on on the market so that we reduce the human interface where possibly um, a national security agent in somewhere in Boku market every month, I have to call them and tell them that, okay, around this time, this is the price of an Olonka of, of, of maize or something. And that's also doing the same. I mean, you never know <laughs> what data they are giving. And you cannot follow those who are calculating the, the index in Accra. I mean, it's what they get. It's what they use to calculate. So, um, I don't know to what extent that whole process is subjected to scrutiny to ensure that we are getting that great data. Mm -hmm. But that is what should be done. I mean, now yeah, you've had people, and, and normally it's, it's not only one product. That's something that I need to make clear. So, um, so for instance, if you know that a particular product has increased by 400%, it could be in a market basket, but it's way to be so low that its over, overall impact on the average prices in the basket will not be that, that large. So these are our considerations that we need to, but it's important that we collect accurate data. And it's one thing in, 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 in the developing world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of the data that we collect, normally we do not do that um, with, with strict scrutiny. And, and at times, that is why some of the policies that we pursue on the basis of the data we find are not having the right impact because the data itself is not very... Um, I would say that the whole process of collecting the data is not done with integrity. And so, at times because the, we are not investing into the data collection, that's the point. So, people are just collecting any data anyhow and then we are feeding that into policy making. So, yes, at times you begin to wonder if this inflation means what it actually is, but to a large extent, we see it should. It should reflect what is going on there in the, in the, in the Yeah, in but the in economy. our current circumstances where most prices have shot up 400%, yes. 500%, yeah. Yeah. an inflation rate of even 17% is questionable. Yes, but you see, the way it's computed, the weight, so we need to find out the weight because I think that the one that has the greatest um, um, weight is, is food. So if food prices are not that high then it will turn now on the other relative but they are very shares. high price of maize for example has gone up four times sure in the last four years Qu has quadrupled yeah i, I don't want uh, gary I, I, has tripled I, I don't want to raise issues with as an economist i mean yeah. and then given that i know those who are there are very competent there's no statistician with a friend is a very competent guy and i i know those who are so i don't want to raise issues about the competence of the collection of the whole thing. So mm -hmm. I want to think that to a greater extent, the data that we are collecting, but you are raising very legitimate issues. I mean, people buy goods from the markets and they know what is happening to their pocket. And so they'll be wondering, but it's, it's, it's much more than that because it's, it's done with weights and depending on the, and so that is why it's important that also that we frequently update that market basket is very important. I mean, it's possible that the expenditure shares are changing. It's possible that the, the volume of goods that are being consumed currently is changing. So 
if the market basket is, is way far off in the past, that could also be part of the reason. So I think that's important that we, we occasionally, if we can, I mean, because we don't have money, but if we can, we should. And I'm saying that if we, if we use digital technology to collect data, it's possible that every two years we can update our market basket so that it will truly reflect. But I'm not going to say that I, I have doubts if... <laughs> <laughs> I cannot do that because I don't have the information to, yes, to do that. Yes. But I'm saying that these things are possible. Yeah, it's very possible, it's possible. Prof, lowering inflation, is it always necessary and good for the health of the economy? No. I mean, I'm not taking really the inflation indicator and so because inflation is low, the economy is healthy. The other very important macro indicators that are also show, of course, uh, the fiscal indicators are very important. Um, inflation is one of the main headline indicators that we use, but obviously there are others. I mean, when inflation is low, interest rates would also be low. I mean, there's a direct link between them. And so uh, you want to watch the extent to which inflation is feeding into uh, interest rates because interest rates is also a very important variable. I mean, when interest rates are low, it enables the private sector to borrow, expand productive activities, and then offer jobs, and an economy is doing well. So I'll not only say inflation, but it only tells us that relative to the past, the rate at which prices are increasing have declined. That's all that it, tell, it tells us. <laughs> so it means that we are doing something about the rate at which prices are increasing relative to the past year. And so when we see that, we should be excited that maybe something is happening for us to reduce price. But it is not the only indicator to measure the elastic of the economy. I mean, those politicians use it every time, but obviously they are, there's much more to look at in the economy rather than only concentrate on inflation. Well, we're taking another short break, and uh, we are in conversation with Professor Festus Ebo Texan. And we're talking about the state of the Ghanaian economy. Now, when we come back, I'd like to pose a question about the gross domestic product, GDP. What is it? What does it mean? What does it really reflect? When you hear the politicians talking about GDP and so on, <laughs> what is it? Short break. Me, I have still not got the money for that list of expensive building materials you sent to me. The price of the iron rods have been increased too much, are they? But now, relax. Look, that's not why I even called you. I just visited IPCP, where the engineers told me everything about Chosako first floor. Chosako, please, those people are expensive. Are they not the people building those big, big houses in town? I beg, go to the But now, in fact, I used to think the same of until I visited their office today and they gave me an estimate of how much it will cost. No more! The estimate is free oh. It's cheaper than the one I even sent you! Wow! Building contractors, foremen, masons, visit IPCP, the Trasaco Fast Floor. Engineers will assist you build an affordable, faster and stronger building. Ever Trasaco! Oh, madam, madam! <laughs> it is done! Wow! Trasaco Fast Floor. Stronger, faster, and affordable. This is a Trasaco construction product. Hello, welcome back to Talk Time. And we are in conversation with Professor Festus Ebo Texan from the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. And uh, we are talking about the economy, the state of the economy. We are talking about inflation. We are talking about how data is collected, how more efficiently it may be done, and so on. Now, Doc, we hear the politicians talk a lot about the gross domestic product. What is it? GDP. What is it? So the gross domestic product is the, the total amount of goods and services that are produced within the geographical boundaries of a country over a period of time, usually one year. So it is the best estimate of economic activities that take place within an economy. And to a large extent, it talks about the output that an economy is able to generate in a year. It's, it's the most important economic indicator because it's 
reflective of how well the economy is doing in terms of the real sector. Uh, you know, the monetary sector is just a numerator. I mean, so it, are just values that we use to gauge what is going on. But the real sector, in terms of employment, in terms of output, and all of that, is relative to the gross domestic product. Which means that when the GDP is growing, the presumption is that we are producing more output. And it could be as a result of, if our productivity is fixed, it could be as a result of the fact that the economy is expanding and we are employing more people to work. That is why you can use the GDP growth rate as an indicator of how well the economy is doing in moving forward. Because we need to expand the economy. Uh, we've not reached anywhere where the potential, our potential is given the enormous endowment that God has given to us. So the faster we grow, the better. One thing about development is that as you grow, your growth is supposed to be highest as you move along the growth trajectory. And when you are getting up there, it turns down because the growth rate is the rate of change. So if, the, if, if your, your, your GDP itself is very high, the growth rate will be smaller because the change, rate of change on the, on the, on the, on the um, actual. So it means that developing countries, low-income countries should be growing faster than the High income country. That's something that we see every time in, in, in them. It's just that the levels at which we are supposed to grow our GDP to try to emulate what the East Asian Tigers did, we have not been able to achieve that. And, and um, at times there's some resemblance of getting to that level. You know, for instance, in 2017, we got 8.4%. It's not bad. I mean, if you can maintain at least 6.5% for a period of, of 10 years, that would be a huge jump in uh, economic expansion. So if politicians make noise about this, they only want to show you that they are doing well. Um, and, and, and what is important is that we need to do a discussion on where the growth is coming from. It's very important. As we speak, the service sector is driving our growth, which is not really a good sign for a country like Ghana. Being an agrarian economy, we should see agriculture driving that growth. And I tell us, my student of development economics that the growth trajectory is very simple. For countries like us, and in fact, in almost all countries, agriculture starts the growth process. And you do agriculture so well to the extent that you begin to add value, especially agro-processing to manufacturing, and the industry takes over. But when industry takes over, it needs the agricultural sector to be supportive in an economy like ours. And when industry does so well, begin to produce manufacturers from simple to highly sophisticated manufacturers, then you move into services. Because to produce highly sophisticated manufacturers, it needs the support of services, and services takes over. So all countries that have gotten to where we want to get to have used this very simple trajectory to, to get to where we are. But no. I mean, after Dr. Nkrumah started, so let's take from independence, initiatives on agriculture, we knew how well he did with agriculture and all of that. Um, we moved into a sort of import substitution industrialization, which is agro-processing. And at that time, the East Asians had successfully done that. And we know his strong leanings to, to that economic market that was going on there. So the understanding and the setting up of GEOC and other industries were meant to it just so happened that our culture after it was overthrown wasn't giving enough support. And if you recall, I mean, I know you are much older. I'm a small boy. I was, mm -hmm. I'm just reading from history. No, but uh, you, 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 <laughs> you have actually studied. Yes, but, 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 but you are there. You, you know it. I mean, I tried on trying to do something of that sort to, to, to see how we can recover agriculture through its operation, feed yourself, all of that. Mm. But over the years, we've not done well with agriculture. So as we speak, service agriculture does, it's the mainstay of employment in this economy. It's, it's, it's until recently, was the least contributor to our growth, mm -hmm. which shows a serious structural bottleneck, imbalance. And if we don't go back to start the whole process, we'll go nowhere because the service sector that is driving 
our growth. It's not productive service sector. Mainly the mobile network revolution that is going on. That's what is driving all of this. Mm -hmm. We need to create jobs for the youth. And the only way we can do that is through our culture and agro process industrialization. That is why I get excited when I hear about this 1D1F policy. Good policy. I mean, for me, I think it's one of the best that we've pursued after Kwame, Dr. Kwame Kuma, giving his, uh, uh, the whole idea. And what we are doing is what we are doing now. We are just putting more emphasis on that. And it's good if we are able to do that successfully because what we end up doing is that we are not only going to substitute for the imported goods that we put, some of which we don't need to import them, but we also begin to use the West African African market through the after to be an uh, export destination for these simple manufacturers. I mean, producing food juice and those things are so basic manufacturers that there are a lot of countries in West Africa. When you go to a land areas, that would be a very good destination for our export. So it means that our kind of growth, however good it looks, if you go down to look at the sectors that are contributing to the growth, there's, there's an issue there. So our structural transformation has not followed the, what the literature, what the norm has been. And so we need to go back and see how best we can get back to it. So, um, yes, the GDP is very important. We should get excited when our GDP is growing. But we should be more excited when it's being driven by agriculture and to some extent industry. I'm not saying the service sector is not important. The service sector is important, but the Ghanaian economy has not developed to a level. And when we want the service sector to drive growth, it should be high productive service activities, not the low productive ones. So, um, the GDP is important. It's good that the politicians talk about it. But when it comes up, the debate should be at the content. What is driving that growth? And, and once we are able to make our agriculture industry the drivers of our growth, they will not only assure our use of employment opportunities, mm. but it also means that we are taking advantage of the endowment that we have because that's where we have the comparative, competitive advantage to harness the potential that we have to let our economy grow. And when you get to that point, a whole lot of issues that we talk about the economy, we'll not be talking about them. I mean, I share case studies of the East Asia America with my students every time. And they are surprised how these countries were able to do that. And it was because of leadership. We need the right leaders also in place to ensure that we keep focus on that goal of getting to that point. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's not going to... It's always going to be what we've done over the last 40 years or so. Uh, we go, we hit them, we come back, we go and hit And I don't think that this time we have any reason to, to do that again. We should learn from our past. And so GDP, yes, is important. We need to look at the drivers of growth and make sure that we are doing it right. Prof, thanks very much for coming to the studio. We are most grateful to you. And uh, anytime we have difficulties with trying to understand the economy, we do hope that uh, you come back and help us to understand what is happening in the economy. We've just brought this program to an end. We're talking to Professor Festus Ebo Texan of the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. Uh, before we come to you again, uh, please keep your dial on Pan-African Television because as you do know, uh, we bring you the best in news, we bring you the best in current affairs, best in sports, indeed best in everything. So keep your dial here until we meet again next week. Um, until then, it's goodbye from all of us at Pan-African Television, from George Binet, who is the producer of the program, and also from Adam Lumon, who directed the show. Bye-bye.